Thanks for watching CMTV. We know you'll be blessed by this week's message. Be sure to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. Visit cmjacksboro.com for more information about our church and ways you can get involved. Thanks for joining us and welcome home. How do I follow all that? Mm, yeah. How, I, I know it. How do I follow that? How can I compete with that? Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Appreciate you getting out. If you would, let's declare what God's Word says, please. I believe all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that I may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Therefore, I believe in Him who has sent, the Lord Jesus Christ, I believe he died on the cross for my sin, arose three days later, and sits right hand of the Father, interceding for me. Therefore, I am in Christ. Christ is in me. I am a new creation. I have been justified. I am being sanctified. I will be glorified. I am the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. Lord Jesus, prepare my heart and open the eyes of my understanding that I may receive your word. Give me ears to hear what your spirit has to say. Holy Spirit, thank you for your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. How many of y'all were here this morning an hour early? Anybody? My wife was going to be, but I graciously let her know. She was leaving, and, and I, I said, uh, what does your watch say? And she told me, and I said, well, you might look at your, at your phone because your phone is updated. And so she didn't have to get here an hour early, but she did come on early. You know, this time of year, I love the fall. And I love the, the change of the weather, you know, and sometimes we, we weren't sure last week if we were going to go from, from the summertime straight into winter or if we were going to have a fall season. And here we're looking at another week of 80-degree weather, sounds like. But for me, I enjoy the cool weather. I enjoy the change. And things are continually changing, you know. Time continually changes. You know, there was a country song one time that, uh, that uh, the guy said, time marches on. And the older we get, the more it marches on and the faster it marches on. But I have discovered in life that I've got to be willing and continually willing to change as the times change. I've got to be willing to adjust. The analogy that we have of, of around our country, we have some oak trees and we have some mesquite trees. When a heavy wind blows through, if you look at the mesquites, they broke apart and, and were broke over when the tornado come through. The oak trees might have lost some of their higher limbs ahead, but the base of them, they moved and they flowed. And on top of that, they had really deep roots to help them grow and stay strong. You and I need to make sure our roots are going really deep. The Bible tells us very plain that, that the, Paul, the Apostle Paul said he wanted to forget everything which lied behind. He wanted to forget all the things about how, how educated he was, about his bloodline, about everything that was in his life. And all he wanted to know was Christ and him crucified. We're told that no other foundation can we lay except for Christ and him crucified. That foundation of the apostles and the prophets, that foundation of the Old Testament and the New Testament coming together. And last week I shared with you that there were some things that I've seen in quote ministry. I surrendered to ministry uh, over 40 years ago. And, and I wish that I could tell you that everything had gone good and everything was smooth in that time, but it hasn't been. And I've had to continually be willing to stretch. I have had to continually be willing to bend and move because I began to realize that a lot of things that I believed and the things that I, taught grow, that, that I was taught growing up as I studied and I sought out things of God, I realized that, that a lot of it was tradition of man. A lot of it was man-made. A lot of it had nothing to do with God's Word and what God was truly doing. 
as I go to Israel and I get to see things in Israel, I begin to see a different perspective and I begin to see things differently than I've always seen things. As we look at what's going on in our world right now, we see so much chaos. We see so much confusion that is round about us. We see the war that is, has started and that's been going on for several weeks now in Israel. I've given you the definition of Hamas, and Hamas is violence. Hamas is pure evil. And, and I gave you some words that I believe that I've seen that has taken place, and I believe that the enemy has infiltrated the church of the living God, just like the enemy had infiltrated the Gaza Strip. The Gaza Strip was a piece of land that belongs to Israel, but the Palestinians had held on to it. They named their name Palestinians because of the Philistines, Israel's uh, enemies. And, and as you look at it, the, the Gaza Strip borders Egypt and Israel. You go up in the Golan Heights and you see that the Golan Heights borders Jordan. You go to the, the other side and you see, I'm, I'm sorry, Syria. And then you go to the other side and, and you see that it borders Jordan. And you see these different enemies round about them. And as the enemy has tried to infiltrate, and, and as he's infiltrated, another word that I gave you was the infiltration has taken place, but also another word that has taken place is he's tried to indoctrinate. He tries to bring about an indoctrination to make you believe something. If you listen to the news, if you listen to the media, you're going to hear some indoctrination take place. Years ago, Sadie and I were in Arizona at, a, at an event and, and we were with David and Cheryl and we were watching this video of the Indian and the culture that took place in that area in Arizona. And all of a sudden as it's playing, I'm watching it, I have Indian her heritage and Indian culture within me and so I'm all enraptured within it, listening to it and all of a sudden David jumps up and he says, I ain't listening to this and he just storms out. And I thought, what the heck was that? And so I walked out. And I said, David, explain this to me, man. And he says, that ain't truth. He said, that's not truth. That is propaganda. Every bit of it is propaganda because none of it is the truth. I have the history, and I can prove you the history does not line up with their propaganda and what they are saying. And I began to realize then, that was nearly 20 years ago, and I began to realize that that, that indoctrination has been taking place for many years. I've been hearing more and more speakers and they've been talking about how public education and how the, our children have been indoctrinated about socialism, about communism. And you, they can go back and they can begin to show you the dates. If you study history and you find out that, the, that some of the wisest scholars and our founding fathers said that if you do not know your history, then you are bound to re repeat your history. And, and we see that there's a, a thing that's going on right now is to wipe out the history of the United States the same way that they want to wipe out the history of Israel. If you go and you read your Bible and you see what God told Abraham, and He said, Abraham, this is your land. This is my promised land that I'm given to you and your descendants forever. And he lines it out, and this is yours. But see, all of history, they are trying to wipe that out. And so today, I'm going to give you another word that the enemy is trying to do. The enemy has infiltrated Israel. He has infiltrated the church. He has done it through indoctrination, by indoctrinating the people. And he has done it through intimidation, if, you're not, if you don't pay attention to the indoctrination, then they're going to try to intimidate you through intimidation. And the whole purpose of all of it is about annihilation. And the word in Webster's Dictionary, if you look up the word annihilate, the word annihilate means to completely destroy or to, or to obliterate, to cause to cease to exist. That is what is taking place today. If you go back in history, and just since 1967, you'll see that there have been seven wars in Israel. That they have come to assault Israel to try to take back the land. 
that God gave to them when they were reestablished and they became a nation again. The whole ploy of the enemy is to annihilate. I told you that I've been seeing the number 1010 every time I look up. And when you look at John chapter 10, verse 10, he says, The thief came only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But the Jesus came that we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. And so I see in that that the enemy is trying to totally destroy Israel. But what I want you to see today and what I want you to look at today, if you'll go to the book of Ephesians chapter 2. In Ephesians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul was teaching the church at Ephesus. And as he was teaching, he began to explain to them and he began to tell them some things that I think that is very important for the church today to look at, for the church to examine, for the church to go through. In Ephesians chapter 2, beginning with verse 1, look in my briefcase and throw me my glasses, please, so I can see my Bible. Thank you. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. What I want you to understand is you were born into sin. When you were born, you were born into sin. When Adam disobeyed God and he ate of the fruit, sin entered the world. And from then on, every generation, we had that sinful nature. We were born into sin. So all were sinners the day you were born. The day you were conceived, you were a sinner. And if you are a sinner, then you need a Savior. And there is only one Savior, and that Savior is Jesus Christ. And that's what we're talking about here. Verse 4, But God, who is rich in His mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved and raised up, us up together to make us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We were crucified with Christ. We rose with Christ. We are seated with Christ. Christ became sin on our behalf. He died for all sin. He took all sin, becoming that sin. And so when we receive Christ, we have been crucified with Him, died with Him, buried with Him, rose with Him, and positionally, you and I sit in the heavenly places. And so positionally, we are sitting with Him. But practically, we are here on this earth, and so we are to bring heaven to earth. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we are to bring that positionally to here. Okay, and then He said He raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, He might show the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. You can't work enough. You can't give enough. You can't do enough. You can't be good enough. It is only by God's grace that you must be saved. We live in this body of humanity, and there's always going to be a war between the flesh and the Spirit of God. When you were born again, when you trusted Christ, you were born again of incorruptible spirit. Your spirit was incorrupted. And so it cannot be corrupted. And so we're born again by God's grace. Not of works, verse 9, lest anyone should boast. For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God be prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Do you catch that? He prepared good works for you to walk in beforehand. Because as He walked, so you walk. Verse 11, Therefore, remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision, by which is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, 
that at the time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. God came for Israel. And there was no hope for us, the Gentiles. There was no hope because we were not Jews. We were not Israel. But then he says that, but now Christ, Jesus, who once were, those who once were afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. There was a wall of separation between the Jew and the Gentile. The Greek, the Scythian, the slave, they could not be apart. They could not follow God. They could not be God's sons and daughters. You understand? And he's, he's telling us, but we have been brought near and he's brought peace who has made both one, has broken down that middle wall of separation, have abolished, 15, in his flesh the enmity, that war, that hatred, that strife. That is the law of commandments contained in ordinances so as to create in himself one new man from the two. Thus making peace. God made peace between Israel and the Gentiles, between them and us. He died for us. And He made the one new man. So when you look at Israel, you must see yourself. Do you understand? We have been grafted in. We are joint heirs. We have been joined together through the blood of Jesus. So they are one with us and we are one with them. Do they believe that today? Well, not all of them. Not all of them. Because they haven't come to the full saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus. And so we're to pray for that peace. That's why the scripture behind me, Psalms 122.6, says pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And blessed are those who do. And so we pray for that peace. The only peace there is is when they come to this peace that Jesus makes. There is no peace without Jesus because it is His peace that He gives to us. John 14, 27. My peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, but as only I can give. The prophets will say to you, peace, peace. But they're whitewashed walls. There is no peace. Because the only peace there is is through Christ and Him crucified. Verse 15, Have abolished in His flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in Himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, that He might reconcile them both to God in one body, through the cross, therefore putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. The Jew and the Gentile, we both have access to the Father. God did not replace the Jew. He did not replace Israel with you and I. There ought to be everybody saying yes and amen. There is no replacement theology. It is a lie from the pits of hell. It is an indoctrination that has been brought in, that has been infiltrated into the church of the living God. Do you understand when I say the enemy is infiltrated? When the Christian church, when the sons and daughters of the Most High God said, oh, well, it don't matter, we know It's us, the one new man. We, together, they and us, the one new man. For through him, verse 18, through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, 
whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. We are being built together as a dwelling place of the Lord in the Spirit. When you study the Greek, that word dwelling place means habitation. The word habitation means a permanent residence. Permanent. Do you understand? Permanent residence. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, when you read this, it will give you a reference to go to John chapter 17, verse 23. And in John 17, 23 is where Jesus is praying that you and I and the Jew might be one as He and the Father are one. God the Father indwelling each and every one of us. God the Son indwelling each and every one of us. God the Holy Spirit indwelling each and every one of us, making us complete, making us perfected in and through Christ Jesus. And so when he's talking about he has made the one, and he says that we are the dwelling place of God in the Spirit. If you begin to go through Scripture and you look at Galatians chapter 6, verse 15, he says, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision availeth anything. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, he says that we have been baptized into one body. How many bodies are they? How many dwelling places are they? How many churches are they? Thank you! First Corinthians 12, 13 says you are baptized into one body. Jews, Greeks, slave, free, we are all one. He says in the spirit there is neither male nor female. Scythian, slave, Jew, Greek, there is neither, none, because we are all one in and through him. Galatians 2, 28 says there is neither Jew nor Greek. Neither availeth, because we are all one in and through Christ Jesus. And so as I look at this, and I'm going through all of this, I look at what is taking place around about us, I look at today, and if y'all did not know it, today is the 309th day of 2023. There are 56 days left in this year. There are eight Sundays after today left in this year. If we go back in time and in January last year, on, uh, I gave you a word this year of January the 1st, the word rewind, that was the word that I heard, was rewind. Well, God, what are you talking about? Well, I wasn't getting it. I wasn't understanding. You know, I had VHS tapes and I had to take them back and if you didn't rewind those things, they would charge you. And so I know about rewinding, okay? And so what are you talking about, God? When I went to Webster's Dictionary, and I just pulled up my Webster's Dictionary, and I'm saying, God, I don't understand. What are you talking about rewind? The word of the day on my dictionary was retrospection, to survey the past. And I went, wow, Lord, that's what you're talking about is retrospection and introspection. I'm to survey the past. Well, how about surveying the past today after Hamas is trying to destroy Israel? You survey the past and you'll find out it belongs to Israel. Okay, if we rewind and we introspectively look internally and we survey the past, so this whole year I've gone back and looked at Christian mission and the teachings that we began with. I began with Matthew 21 that, that we are the temple of God. And as the temple of God, we are to be a house of purity. We are pure, period, because of Jesus Christ in whom crucified. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ, the righteousness of God in you. The only reason that we are the house of purity is because Christ is in us. And so we've got to see ourselves as Christ sees us as a house of purity. Then we see ourselves as a house of prayer. What do we pray about? We pray about everything. The Holy Spirit will intercede for us with groanings too deeply understood as we're praying and seeking the Lord because we're that house of prayer and because we're a house of power 
because we understand the Holy Spirit of God will intercede and He will guide us and direct us into all truth. Then we understand that we're a house of praise, that we're to praise God continually in all things. The Apostle Paul said, rejoice in all things. And again, I say, rejoice. Right now, I see a lot of the church is not rejoicing. Why are they not rejoicing? Because they are wringing their hands and they're terrified that we are living in the last days. If we're living in the last days, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. What better time to live than to see Christ return? What better time than to see the glory of God? So why are we concerned about that? This weekend, Sadie and I were at a conference, and in that conference I heard a story about the dark day of, in Connecticut, in New England, on May the, let's see, May the 19th, 1780. The Connecticut legislator was in session, and they were meeting. And on that day, all of a sudden it began to get dark. And by 2 o'clock in the afternoon, the chickens were in their roost. The roosters were, were hiding out because it was black. It was like midnight. They could not see anything. The sun did not shine. They could not see anything. It was so black. And people were running. When I studied, and I went back because I heard this, and I went back and I studied it. And when I studied it, it said people were running to two places. Guess what the places they were running to? Church. And where was the other place? The bar. The saloon. There were two groups of people. Well, if this is it, I'm going to get drunk and not feel none of it. Others were at church terrified that this was the end. In 2001, when the Twin Towers fell, that Sunday, every congregation in Jack County was packed because everybody thought it was the end. And so they wanted to make sure they had their ticket punched right. They wanted to make sure they had their fire insurance. But I stood up and I taught on Matthew 24 and I said, this ain't the end. And I watched them literally go, whoo, and they never came back. So the people were afraid that this was the end. The legislator was in Congress, I mean was in conference, and they were meeting. And as they were meeting, all of them said, oh, we got to adjourn, we got to leave, we got to go. And there was one man out of the whole bunch named Abraham Davenport. And Abraham Davenport sitting there, when they wanted to adjourn, he says, I am against adjournment. The day of judgment is either approaching or it is not. If it is not, there is no cause for adjournment. And if it is, I choose to be found doing my duty. I wish, therefore, that you bring the candle so we can see and continue business. You can look this up and there was a poem written about this man. And in the poem it says that Davenport says, I choose to occupy till Christ returns. And what he is quoting is out of the book of Luke chapter 19. And in Luke 19 verse 13, Jesus told the ones that he gave the talents and he says, do business till I come. In the, new, in the King James he says, occupy Till I return. Some of the other words that are used in different in, interpretations of the Bible are invest, put this to work, engage in business, conduct business till I have come. So what is it about you and I? What are we to be about doing when everybody is saying this is the end? Well, we need to be about the Father's business. We need to continue to doing and occupying and do business till he returns. We need to have that same mentality that Mr. Davenport had in 1780. If y'all want to study this, go to May 19, 1780 and study the dark day. 
Do you know what else I discovered they called it? Black Friday. How many of y'all go shopping on Black Friday? Guess what? Black Friday is about you doing business till Christ returns. So daughter-in-law, quit going to Black Friday sales. You need to do business. That was free. So as you go through Scripture and you see that God has made the one out of the two, and we see that what God has seen about rewinding and looking. And, and so we've had 11 months to look back on or 10 months to look at, back on, on this year of rewind. One of the words that I gave you on Rosh Hashanah in September of last year, the word that I gave you was that exposure is coming. Exposure is coming to Israel. Exposure is coming to the church. Think about, here we are, 12 months later. What is being exposed? Do you know how much anti-Semitism is taking place in the United States today? What I want you to understand, if the whole goal is annihilation, and that if you are one with Israel, the church is one, that we are the one new man, then guess what the goal of the anti-Semites are for you? Can you wrap your head around this one? The whole goal is to annihilate you. To annihilate you. As I go to Mr. Webster, he says to completely destroy or to obliterate, to cause to cease to exist. The spirit that is behind Hamas, the spirit that is behind the anti-Semitism is all a spirit that is led by the devil himself, Satan of old, the dragon of old. The deceiver of the brethren, the father of lies, all of these, are behind, he is behind it in his goal. John 10, 10, the thief came only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And so the enemy's purpose for your life is to annihilate you. So you think you might ought to stand up for Israel, church? Because as Israel goes... So goes the church. So goes the U.S. Because the same plan, the same ploy is being used to infiltrate, to indoctrinate, through intimidation. I want to give you another one that came to my mind. How about inoculation? Inoculation. What's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think about inoculation? You got to take the shot. I had a friend call me two years ago whenever the shot began. And he was going to speak at a church up north in Arkansas. And as he was going to speak, the pastor was telling all his people to take the shot. He was telling them they had to take it. And he said, I'm fixing to confront it. He says, is the shot the mark of the beast? And he asked me just like that on a phone call. I had no time to think, and I said, no, sir, it is not. It is a precursor for the mark of the beast. It is not the mark, but it is a precursor. If you study and you look what the word precursor is, the word precursor is one that proceeds. On the cellular level, it is one to be added to. It was a trial run, you know. It was a trial run to see how many sheep would follow. When you look at the word in doctor in ink, anik, easy for me to say. Inoculation means to introduce something into the mind. To introduce something into the mind, or the body. Into the mind, or the body. So the enemy is trying to inoculate us. You know where the battleground is? Right between your ears. 
Did you know he's trying to inoculate you into believing it's okay to have men and women that stand before you and preach the word of God that are practicing sexual immorality? They're telling you that it's okay. And they're presenting it to the body of Christ. Well, if we go back and we look at what I began with about Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, he says, In whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit, that permanent habitation, that permanent residence. He says in that... What do you not know? Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit of God. He says, be holy, for I am holy. Well, what do we do as a church? What do we do as believers? What do we do as the body of Christ? I'm going to give you five things. It's very simple. I go to the book of of Luke, and I've been studying the book of Luke. And this morning I was reading in Luke, and, and I just saw there was five simple things to do. Number one, Luke chapter 2, verse 49, Jesus' parents came to him and said, What do you think you're doing? He said, What are you looking for me for? Didn't you know I'd be about my father's business? You know what that word means? Be about my father's business? Jesus said, My food is due to the work of him who sent me. Jesus said, I only say what the Father tells me to say. I only do what I see the Father doing. So Jesus was about the Father's business. So number one, we're to be about the Father's business. Number two, Luke chapter 12, verse 37, He says, Blessed are those servants whom the Master, when He comes, will find them watching. And then He goes on to 43 and He says, Watch and those that are so doing. Well, as you look at the word watching, the word watching means tending to. It means to keep guard of. It means expectantly watching. See, a lot of the infiltration of the church and the indoctrination of the church is, oh, well, you're going to be out of here so you don't have to watch. You don't have to worry. You're going to be out of here before Christ returns. Well, I go back to a man named Abraham Davenport in 1780 that says, if this is the day of the Lord, so be it. I'm going to be doing what he told me to do. I'm going to be occupying if he returns. I'm going to be waiting and watching expectantly. I'm going to be the watchman on the wall. John chapter 4, verse 34, Jesus said, My food is to do the will of Him who sent me to finish His work. Number 3, Luke chapter 19, verse 13. And He said, Do business till I come. Occupy. Number 4, Luke chapter 21, verse 14. Let me read this to you. Look at verse 7. The title of this is The Signs of the Times and the End of the Age. Though I asked him, saying, Teacher, but when will these things be, and what sign will there be when these things are about to take place? And he said, Take heed that you not be deceived, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time has drawn near. Therefore do not go after them. But when you hear of wars... Commotions, do not be terrified, for these things must come to pass first, but the end will not come immediately. Then he said to them, Did you know that a thousand years is a day to the Lord, a day in the Lord is a thousand years? There have been wars and rumors of wars. In 1780, they thought Christ was returning. How many years has that been since then? What year are we in now? Then he said to them, 
Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be great earthquakes in the various places and famines and pestilences. And there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. Since 1900, there have been over 500,000 reported earthquakes a year throughout the world. There are at least 16 major earthquakes a year since 1900. You go back and you study in the 1700s. Y'all, take time. Don't just believe everything that everybody tells you. Don't just run with everything I tell you. Go study it out. Go look and study it for yourself. We got this great thing on this smartphone that you ask a question and it'll research stuff for you. It's amazing. Go and look. The earthquakes. The tsunamis, all of those things, they've been going on. And it says they'll continue on. Before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and the prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. But it will turn out for you as an occasion for testimony. Verse 14, Therefore, settle. In your heart. James chapter 5 verse 8 says establish your heart for the coming Lord is at hand. It means to settle permanently. Settle permanently. If you're in Christ and Christ is in you, you're going to be okay. It's all going to be all right. It's all going to be all right. So number four is Luke 21 14. Settle it in your hearts. 15, verse 15, For I will give you a mouth and wisdom with which your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. How are you going to do that? Because he says you have an anointing from the Holy One to know all things. He says by His divine power you've given everything to pertain to life and to godliness. Verse 16, You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. Jesus said if they hated me, they'll hate you. If they hate Israel, they're going to hate you. But not a hair of your head shall be lost. By your patience, possess your soul. Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. James chapter 1 says, Let patience have its perfect work within you. Patience, perfect work within you is to cause deception to reveal itself. So be patient. Rule your soul. Number five, Luke chapter 21, verse 36. Watch and pray always. Watch and pray always. So what do I do in the midst of all of this? The thing that came into Connecticut that came into New England that caused the sun to go black. There was a fog that rode in and there was a fire that was in Ontario, Canada. And that fire in Ontario, Canada had so much black smoke and the fog rolled it in and it brought it in that it made the sun go black. And you know what the sun looked like that night? It was blood red that night. They had read their Bibles. And they had read, that it says, before the coming of the day of the Lord, the moon will turn to blood and the sun will go dark. That was 1780. Here we are in 2023. We're still expecting Christ's return. But what I want you to comprehend and I want you to understand, they hated Jesus, they hate Israel, and they hate you if you're a son and a daughter of the Most High God. And so we've got to continue to stand no matter what. There are sales of Hamas in the U.S. because we've welcomed them in. 
but we're not going to be moved. We're going to stand our watch and we're going to occupy till Christ returns. We're going to do business by praying for one another, standing for one another. We're going to preach God's word no matter what is going on around about us. The David, King David, the man after God's own heart, he said, though the mountains be cast into the sea, I shall not be moved. And then he said, soul, you be quiet because my trust is in God. So we've got to take the responsibility. We've got to take the attitude of a 12-year-old little boy and say, I must be about the Father's business. Whatever that means for you, you need to be about the Father's business. Amen? Amen. If you've got your communion cup, we'll take communion now. Father Jesus gave us a very plain example. He told his disciples to take this bread and eat it. It represented his physical body. But Father, as a 12-year-old little boy, he gave us the example that we were about to, to be about, to be about the Father's business. And so, Father, as, as we come before you and, and we take this bread, Father, we do it in remembrance of Christ's life, his death, his burial, his resurrection. Father, we take this bread in remembrance of Christ's love for us. In the same manner, Father, the juice represents that blood of the new covenant. And so, Father, we thank you. For the blood of the new covenant that washes all of our sin away. That gives us the remission for our sin. So, Father, we take this juice in remembrance of Jesus. Amen. Thanks for watching this week's message. If you would like to partner with us financially or support our ministry, text the code KINGDOMLIFE to 94000 or visit our website, cmjacksboro.com.